Welcome to Repro's Fight Back, a podcast on all things repro. I'm your host, Jenny Wetter, and each episode I will be taking you to the front lines of the escalating fight over our sexual and reproductive health and rights at home and abroad. Each episode, I will be speaking with leaders who are fighting to protect our reproductive health and rights to ensure that no one's reproductive health depends on where they live. It's time for Repros to fight back. Welcome to Repros Fight Back. On this week's episode, we're going to talk about sex workers and healthcare. Helping me dig into this topic, I'm super excited to have with me the wonderful Preston Mitchum from Advocates for Youth. Uh, welcome, Preston, and thanks for being here. Thanks so much, Jenny. I really appreciate the invitation. Happy to be here. Uh, you want to take a second and tell us a little bit about Advocates? Sure, yes. For those who don't know, Advocates for Youth partners with youth leaders, adult allies, and youth-serving organizations to advocate for policies and champion programs that really impact young people's sexual health equity throughout the entire world. Uh, so for us, we really describe ourselves as a 501c3 that's dedicated to championing and promoting young people's access to sexual health programming. So, since we're here to talk about sex workers and sex worker health, I think a really important place to start is how would you define a sex worker? Like, who is and who isn't a sex worker? Yeah, so that's such an important question that you ask. One of the things that always gets really tricky is are people who conflate sex work and sex and human trafficking. Absolutely. So those are very two different things, and I often find that when people say they're against sex work, they're not. They're against sex trafficking, and trust me, sex workers are as well. Uh, We're all against sex and human trafficking, right, because it's about what's forced and what's coercive. Um, And so UNA's guidance note on HIV and sex work, which has been refined refined every few often years, every few years, excuse me. Um, And trafficking, it's about trafficking, coercion, deceit. So it results in various forms of exploitation, including forced labor. Sex work is not that. Sex work is about, it does not involve coercion, does not involve deceit. Even when it's illegal, sex work comprises of freely entered into labor, right? So it's people who consensually decide to engage in the sex trade. And it looks like many different things. The interesting thing is today, like that is what we're talking about today. The interesting thing is most people think they're against sex work. They're not. We've accepted it in many forms. It just so some things are more societally accepted than others. If you watch pornography, that is a form of sex work. Um, Strip clubs are forms of sex work. Um, People think sex work is really just the idea of what we see on TV, what Law & Order SVU shows us around these brothels, right? Like that is a form of sex work, but that's one form of sex work. Sex work expands the gamut. So it's important to note that we're not discussing human trafficking, and there's a heavy conflation. We're discussing people who consensually decide to engage in the sex trade for for exchange of money, services, and et cetera. You're right. This is the really key place to start because there is so so much conflation uh, around the two. So I'm glad we're breaking down those barriers today. It's really (laughs) important. So when we're talking about health needs being met, I feel like the one that people hear most about is HIV. And mostly as sex workers, as vectors of disease, but that's a really, one, harmful frame, but not a very full frame. So do you maybe want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, It's a harmful frame, and it's not even a helpful frame, right? Like, certainly we understand that sex workers are at an increased rate for HIV because of discrimination, stigma, cultural incompetency among clinics and other clinical uh, care and other providers. Um, What's really important to note, though, when we're discussing sex work is sex work criminalization. In most countries and most states throughout the entire world, um, sex work in some way is criminalized. And so what is sex work criminalization? So it's criminal penalties attached to the buying and selling of consensual sex. So that is if someone literally is on a social media application or, you know, before something like SESTA and FOSTA, which we can discuss later, um, was used, people would, you know, go on Backpage or Craigslist um, or another form of social media or online communications and say, you know, I, you know, basically set up, set up whatever that exchange is. And then there could be criminal penalties attached to not only buying sex, but selling sex. Right. And so because of that, many people don't get tested. It drives sex works underground. So that in turn exacerbates public health outcomes, um, one of which is HIV. But that's only one of them. As you just so brilliantly noted, globally, female sex workers, uh, many sex, 
all sex workers, frankly, but mostly female sex workers, continue to be framed largely in terms of HIV acquisition and risk, um, although as though it represents the full depth and breadth of their health work or their health experiences. Um, and so while rights-based prevention, treatment, and care is essential, sex workers are people with a range of sexual and reproductive health and rights needs and the right to comprehensive, non-discriminatory care, um, including service delivery. So to be clear, over the years, the U.S. government has gradually intensified its programming when it comes to sex work um, and sex work programming, such as linkages, as an example of what happens with U.S. agencies working with key populations. Um, so that's recent projects, but it, we, it, would, it, would be do, it would do a disservice to not talk about family planning services, gender-based violence really, you name it, maternal and child health care, out, poor SRHR outcomes that expands beyond the gamut of HIV. Again, HIV is definitely a component of some of the, um, the outcomes that sex workers can have because of the, the institutionalized, sometimes racism, misogyny, patriarchy that happens within uh, healthcare systems and what happens literally to the bodies of sex workers. Uh, but HIV is not it. It's an endemic issue beyond HIV. Yeah, and you talked a little bit about stigma. You know, you have that on the provider side as well. Exactly. So it's hard for them to find providers who will treat them. So beyond prevention, when you're thinking about HIV treatment, mm -hmm. um, that can be a real barrier as well. Yes, absolutely. It's, it's, it's a consistent barrier. And I do think it's one of the things that's really important is the way we all discuss sex. One of the things that's really important is the way we all discuss sex work. You know, I think it's really important that for us to not stigmatize sex work. And so I'll be very transparent. There's applications that some of your viewers may or may not know, some of which are jacked, grinder. Some people call them hookup apps. But they're really, I mean, they're just for exchange of communication. But yes, some people do use them to, to have sex. On many of those profiles, on some of those profiles, rather, you'll see, you know, folks who are like generous folks only, right? And so what that triggers are people saying, I have sex for money or other services. It could be a place to live. Um, and so many other people in their other profiles will post things that are negating their experiences, saying things like get a real job. Well, sex work is a job. Sex work is labor. You know, the, the reason why we want to frame sex work as labor is because there are certain conditions that are attached to people who are actually fully and viable employees, at least the way we look at it as, as people living in the United States. And so for us, what that means is the way we talk about sex work must be in a way that's non-discriminatory, that doesn't put value-based judgments against someone's, right? Because what we're doing is creating a bubble of folks for like in judging them for the way they access services and the way they access money while we're doing jobs that many of us hate on a daily basis right we just right. do it in ways that that look different that the u.s government taxes frequently um that makes us get up at eight o'clock in the morning every day and, and dread it and post facebook statuses about <laughs> it right and so i think we can have that conversation but we need to be very honest about why many sex workers engage in in the sex trade right sometimes people are just happy about doing it because they're good at it they're good at sex and that's okay um other people are you know trans folks who are discriminated against and they can't get any other jobs so what happens are uh, is they re they resort to the sex work sometimes it's called survival sex and so i think it's important for us when you and i your viewers and other people are having this conversation to make sure that we're not having a conversation in a way that's really harmful to sex workers you know another area that you touched on a little bit is family planning needs a lot of times people just think about well they're sex workers they just need to prevent a pregnancy, not thinking about their life outside of their job, right? Absolutely. Like that maybe they want to get pregnant with their partner, but not the people that they are engaging in sex work with. Right. Well, sex workers have families. Exactly. Sex workers need to take care of their families. We're not going to take care of sex workers' families. We, heck, some of us complain that sex workers even have families because how dare they, right? How dare they do something that's looked at as so reprehensible and still mm -hmm. be able to take care of their their loved ones? And, and, and for us, it's very simple, right? Like, people are people. Their experiences are their experiences, and people need to be able to take care of their families as best as possible. Um, and so, you know, that and that that is where I stand as someone who is a part of the founding member of the Sex Workers Advocates Coalition. We're really looking at ways to decriminalize sex work all over the District of Columbia, and hopefully that expands out to the entire nation and eventually the world. You know, like people have sex workers have children. 
right? Like, it's the same way that, you know, my mom, you know, who was not a sex worker, would take me to the doctors, right? Because I needed healthcare needs. She needed healthcare needs. You know, why would we not also grant that right. to sex workers simply because they perform labor in ways that are different than you and I? Uh, and I think that is the problematic stance that many of us finds ourselves in. We're making value-based, usually religious-based, moral-based judgments on people and how they access money. Um, you know, and what we're not doing is finding solutions. And apart from not finding solutions, we're criminalizing that behavior. We're literally telling people, you are doing something that's so vile, that's so vitriolic, that we're going to attach a penalty, and you can go to jail for up to 10 to 15 years just for what's called prostitution-related offenses, right? We're not looking for solutions. And, and with that, we could talk about mass incarceration and about how mass incarceration doesn't help anyone especially not marginalized communities, particularly marginalized communities who are LGBTQ+, who are black and brown, those who are economically, socially, and systemically disenfranchised. So it's very harmful. And so, you know, when we talk about sex work criminalization, it's also important to really talk about the harms that mass incarceration have on people of color, particularly black folks. Yeah, and when you think about criminalization, it makes it harder for sex workers to report violence, exactly. right? Like if you are worried that the person that you were engaging in sex work with attacked you, it makes it harder to go and report that crime to the police because you're engaging in an illegal activity. Yes, and this is something that happens often, Jenny. And this is something that expands beyond the United States. But in the United States, a couple of years ago, Monica Jones was walking around with a condom, and the police officers used that condom as evidence that she was sex work, that she that she was actually engaging in the sex trade. Which is interesting because ordinarily we talk about condoms as if it's like the the silver bullet to ending HIV. And that you should always have one just <laughs> exactly. in case, right? Just in case. Like... But then when someone does have a condom, they're put in an, an untenable situation because if they are a sex worker, if they are a sex worker, right, then they could not carry a condom and then possibly, you know, acquire HIV or other STIs. And then if they're not, and if they are carrying a condom, they can be arrested as a, as a one, as someone who is a sex worker. And they may not be, but as someone who's literally like, you know, about to engage in the sex trade when they could just be protecting themselves later down the line, just as a casual encounter. Right. Um, and so it's really dangerous when we have things like that in, in, in New York. Um, and that, again, that literally just happened, I believe, in 2014 or 2015. Yeah. We have places in South Africa where sex workers have reported um, that police officers have confiscated their ARV. So literally their medication to, to like, to stop or prevent um, HIV or at least, to, like, and, and stuff like that that we look at every day when it's literally, like, they're literally having their their medication, their medicines removed and detained. Um, and, and this is when they're in, you know, law enforcement facilities. In India, we have examples of what's called raid and rescue operations where they're, like, think they're helping sex workers, but they're really harming sex workers. And they're operating Operations that sometimes happen in beautician or like places of beauty, so like beauty supply, nail shops, etc. And they undermine the needs and well-being of sex workers. Police abuse sex workers and they put them again in this situation of carry a condoms or medication um, to protect your own health care needs and the needs of your clients, frankly, or forego protection out of fear of abuse or exploitation by law enforcement, Uh, neither of which is a real choice and either of which can send someone to jail for a long time or, frankly, have them living with with really a a condition for the rest of their lives, something that they really have been trying to prevent and something in the public health sector that we've been trying to prevent for a long time, too. Right, and, you know, you talk about, you know, the arrests for carrying condoms, but you also worry about, you hear reports, particularly um, overseas, about sex workers encountering violence when enduring from the police during those times. Absolutely. And I mean, what, what we often see happens is even when police officers have this interesting interaction, which is usually violent, frankly, interaction with, with sex workers or the marginalized communities in general, you know, we will stand up. Marginalized communities have often stood up against police officers. We can think of the connection between the LGBT community and in and, and New York. So Greenwich Village, for example, um, where, you know, black and Puerto Rican, mostly trans women stood up and fought against violence from police officers. And this is really no different. There's a clear intersectional link between what's happening in certain communities, particularly marginalized communities. Um, sex workers are no different. But we often still see that the police officers enact force and violence 
even in moments where sex workers are not resisting and fighting back. Now, I'm always for resisting and fighting back. And so I think anyone who follows me on social media knows that. But even in situations where there's no resistance or minimal resistance, there's still a situation where the police officer said this. We know the court system, and I will take the, the unfortunate privilege of being an attorney in this situation, where we know sometimes the justice system, we know most of the time, frankly, the justice system is not just for many right. people. Um, and so, you know, when sex workers are put in this situation where they're every day attempting to just access healthcare services, even when they're not being able to access healthcare services, what often happens is they can be thrown into the prison. So, you know, what we call it sometimes is the clinic, it's this clinic to prison pipeline, right? Like you can sometimes go to the clinic and if you can't go to the clinic, you may still see yourself in, 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 in prison. And so, you know, it's kind of this, this eerie understanding of if you don't get caught up in the school to prison pipeline, you may later down the line still be caught up in the clinic to prison pipeline. You know, I think a lot of times when we talk about sex workers, what people are thinking of are cis straight women Mm -hmm. and often left behind are men or the LGBTQ community and there are groups that are particularly at risk. Yes. I think, you know, it's funny because I think a lot of that is just the way we actually frame healthcare services. The way we frame healthcare services is often for those who can afford it. That's how insurance yeah. happens. That's really how we access healthcare services. So it's frankly, it's insurance providers are not willing to take people who seem like they can be really sick and, and costly. And so, you know, what we see, we still see that privilege happening even in the healthcare spaces. And so when we think of healthcare systems and we think of it in terms of who's cisgender, who's straight, you know, the, the, who has money, um, who has a- access to a good attorney or an attorney at all, who has access to the justice system. That's what we see all the time. This is no different. But when we look at the statistics, we do know that a lot of the, a lot of sex workers from many parts of the world are what's still more of the economically disenfranchised of that community. Um, so they're poor or they're, un- or they're unemployed or underemployed. Um, they're LGBTQ, they're people of color, namely black and brown folks. Um, and, and it's really important to emphasize the inter- intersectional leaks sometimes between trans communities and gay communities and those who engage in sex work. You know, I need for people to understand that sex work, many sex workers are not sex workers just because they want to be. And if they do, that's perfectly fine. That There's still nothing wrong with that. And I also need people to recognize that. But many times we perpetuate why sex work continues. We continue to discriminate against people in the hiring process. We won't promote people. We will ensure that people don't have access to college education. We will ensure people um, and their families are not taken care of. Um, Even when they're screaming for help, we will make sure to enact laws and policies that prevent them from obtaining that help. And so, you know, it's incumbent upon us as as, as advocates and and those who work in policy and research in in comms to make sure that there's a, a proper messaging around what we're discussing when we're discussing sex work, um, particularly sex workers who are really outside of the margins, such as, again, LGBTQ folks, black and brown people, and women. So I think it's a good time to turn to policies and policies that the U.S. has that are harmful. Yeah. So I'm a policy nerd, so I'm always (laughs) pretty, pretty, pretty sad, actually. But I'm always really happy to talk about policy because, you know, there are a lot of policies on the book that impact sex workers that many people may not know about. Um, And so, you know, it's really important to remember that, you know, sex work is everywhere. It's happened. There's always this old quote, like, sex work is the oldest profession. And, you know, and sometimes, you know, people laugh and chuckle, but but it's true. Um, and so, but but it's important to also note that even though sex work is the oldest profession, it hasn't always been criminalized. Um, it is it is humans that have criminalized sex workers, mostly cisgender straight white men, who ironically enough access a lot of sex workers and consistently, um, who then turn around and then ensure they're criminalized. And so, of course, that's dangerous. Of course, that's problematic. So, one of the bigger um, one in U.S. foreign policy that impacts where our, where the United States government money goes overseas is the anti prostitution loyalty oath. Um, and so it's a U.S. policy that's requiring all organization that receives HIV and AIDS funding to explicitly oppose prostitution. So in a real world example, that's if I, you know, am an organization and I receive money from USAID or the State Department that is specifically for HIV. So it's a lot of times attached to PEPFAR money. So within the State Department. Which is the HIV funding. Which is HIV funding, correct. Um, and so I have to sign something that specifically says my organization opposes prostitution, um, which means I can't advocate on behalf of sex work, which means I can't, you know, really, frankly, sometimes probably employ sex workers if I know they're sex workers. But a lot of it is really dangerous because it, it means that I can't do any work, even decriminalization work, which we know is have a public health, like, positive net uh, for sex workers. And so... 
so some of the explicit language is, and I have the copy here, uh, no funds may be used to promote or advocate the legalization or practice of prostitution or sex trafficking, and no funds may be used to provide assistance to any group organization that does not have a policy explicitly opposing prostitution and sex trafficking. So, one, it, it tends to conflate sex work and sex trafficking right. as the same thing. Um, and then, two, it's saying you can't promote or advocate the legalization or practice of it. So you can't say, you know, nothing is wrong with sex work because of this. You can't say if we criminalize sex work, um, it'll be harmful to sex workers. And that's as a condition of U.S. funding, which, and, and, and by the way, the Supreme Court has ruled that that language is unconstitutional because it's a free speech limitation. So we already know when it applies to U.S. non-government organizations that are organizations that are either headquartered in the United States or in another country but are still U.S. registered, um, that the anti-prostitution loyalty oath could not apply to them. So it's a way to apply to foreign non-government organizations, so clinics in Kenya, South Africa, Uganda, Mozambique, etc. It applies to them. Places that may already be limited in funding that are attempting to provide HIV prevention and treatment, maternal health, family planning services. So we're putting these organizations in a really bad situation, in a precarious situation, um, where we're attempting to tell them you cannot use your our money um, to talk about sex work, even if it's going to help them in the long run as far as public health is concerned. Um, and so that's one policy that's important to note. The impacts of the anti-prostitution loyalty oath, oath, there's been studies done, it hasn't netted a single positive result. So what's the purpose of it, right? And that's the question we always have to ask ourselves. It has driven sex work underground. When sex work is driven underground, it exacerbates public health harm. Uh, it reduces chances of obtaining or receiving life-saving services. And it ensures sex workers can't even organize. So they're prevented from even organizing what we would be able to do under the First Amendment under the United States Constitution. Shockingly enough, there's another policy called the NSPD-22. So that's the National Security Presidential Directive uh, 22. So it's, a, it's, it's, it's odd because we rarely issue NSPDs in this country. It's a Bush era document that is on record conflating sex work and sex trafficking. So in the U.S. government alone in the early 2000s, President Bush issued a document that under our own policy conflates sex work and sex trafficking. So, you know, to be completely transparent, you know, when I used to work at the Center for Health and Gender Equity, one of our biggest things that we worked on was trying to get the Obama administration to undo NSPD 22. Unfortunately, he did not. Um, this was during his last year in office, so of course, responding to multiple things. But of course, we were disappointed that we couldn't have a friendlier administration do that right. because we're certainly not going to get it under uh, President nope. Trump. You know, um, and you know how many people work under his administration every day because someone gets fired every day or, <laughs> or quits every day. Uh, and you know, and, and that's an unfortunate thing because while people are getting fired and are quitting, real people are dying. Real people are experiencing mm -hmm. a negative harm and consequence as a result of being marginalized and being disenfranchised from multiple systems. And recently, there's two bills um, in the House and the Senate that were recently passed that were meant to be good for sex workers, but were not. Um, and that's SESTA and FOSTA. So in the House side of Congress, um, FOSTA is the Fighting Online Sex Trafficking Act. On the Senate side, SESTA is the Stop Enabling Sex Trafficking Act. People who have signed these bills really thought they were helping sex workers. They thought they were making life safer for them, but they were not. Um, it was meant to curb online sex work. What it did is Congress effectively got Backpage, which is a database that sex workers use for the exchange of services. Um, they got it shut down. It has continuously drove sex work underground already. SESTA has made it easier for law enforcement to a group that, a group, frankly, that pays for sex workers, and we know this. Um, we also know it's contributed to gender-based violence. We also know that links to, to gun access. Um, and they've been able to document evidence in illegal activity. The, the, but that bill won't make sex workers feel safer. Nothing in the bill um, is done to make sex workers feel safer. There's, there's often this idea that when sex workers are able to obtain the police, are able to report crimes that for some reason they do rapidly and they don't because sex workers realize, frankly, that police officers are often the ones who do abuse and extortion and exploitation onto them. And so I think, 
you know, as, as policy advocates, we have to be careful of recommending solutions that provide an interaction with the police. Um, is it something that's going to be easy? No. Um, in the long run, we really have to determine what will make sex workers feel safer. And it's certainly not more interaction with police. It's frankly less. And, you know, and I know this may not be everyone's position, and this is definitely a personal statement, but I am very abolitionist when it comes to the police force. Um, there's just so many linkages to, to patriarchy and paternalism and violence that, you know, communities for hundreds of years have protected themselves and so we really have to get to understanding what restorative justice principles and practices look like without the, without the police force. Um, and so there's definitely connections when it comes to U.S. foreign policy. Again, we have the anti-prostitution loyalty oath. We have the National Security Presidential Directive. We have SESTA and FOSTA, um, which has, you know, passed and have already we've seen increasing in violence against sex workers. And so there are many things in U.S. foreign policy. Yeah, and again, conflating sex work and trafficking mm -hmm. is really kind of, again, where SESTA and FOSTA we're, you know, trying to stop trafficking. Absolutely. Absolutely. That, that's, that's always, that will always be the end goal is to, to, to stop trafficking, right? But also to have people recognize that nothing is wrong with sex work. And, and I think, you know, it always, it goes back to what we were discussing originally. It's like, what is the difference between right. sex work and sex trafficking, right? Like, we all know that sex trafficking is it's, a problem, right. right? It's about coercion. It's about things that are forced. You know, we, we, we see things pulling on our heartstrings. You know, there's even been things in Law & Order where I'll see when they're, like, automatically make it a sex trafficking issue. And I'm just like, I actually don't know if that was a sex trafficking issue. Um, it could have been sex work. Of course, I'm that nerdy lawyer that will sit <laughs> in front of the TV to analyze everything. But it's important that, you know, we realize that it may not be that situation. And, and, and frankly, Law & Order, I think, has done a disservice to what, you know, it's been on for 20, 20 years or so. But it's really done a disservice to what we think about violence, to what we think about rape and rape culture, to what we think about the interactions with law enforcement and, and the fact that many people look at law enforcement as a solution um, for sex workers that that's not the case. For sex trafficking, I would argue that that may not be the case. Um, but we are not discussing sex and human trafficking here. It is people who voluntarily, adults, who voluntarily engage in the sex trade, right? Um, so that, that, is, that is an important note to make. Yeah, and I think also another important note was shutting down those websites mm -hmm. really limited sex workers' ability to pre-screen mm -hmm. Uh, clients that they were seeing and that this has been shown to help protect sex workers when they can decide who they're going to see by having this kind of barrier between them instead of being on the street. Absolutely. And that, that, and that is a big issue, right? It's like, you know, if you often, if you have a new person coming through who's asking for your services and you can't pre-screen them because they don't have to put in any information online, you could be coming into a situation where that may be your life. And so I think, you know, what members of Congress did not know, likely because they didn't talk to sex workers, was that many sex workers disagreed with SESTA and FOSTA because they already knew that was going to be the case. There was there were places in other countries where that was the case and they saw that that, you know, drove sex work underground, which one, doesn't help, you know, public health and two, puts people's lives at risk. And so I think, you know, you know, I know there's still advocacy efforts against it uh, and really working toward, you know, how do we now, how do sex workers now live under an environment where SESTA and FOSTA exist? Um, sadly enough, there's also been examples on, you know, certain community groups where we know that sex workers are now being like being told by their former Johns, you know, hey, we, we know what's happening. We know that you need us now. And, you know, where does that put a sex worker, you know, mm -hmm. because that's sadly a truthful statement. Um, you know, the lower lessen of services now, or excuse me, increasing of services while also reducing prices now because you have to survive some kind of way. Um, and so I think it's just really critical that we have that conversation of what, what these U.S. policies, both domestically and abroad, can do for the real bodies of people who are experiencing these harms. Great. I think that leads us perfectly into... What needs to be done to help meet the health needs of sex workers? Yeah, decriminalization all the time. I'm <laughs> going to always go back to decriminalization um, because it has to be a decriminalization focus, not a legalization focus. And I think even this podcast can't, <laughs> we'll yeah, have enough time like to talk a about this. Big difference. thing, but I, but I think if we could take like a minute just yes, to like tease yes. out the difference so, a little bit. Yeah, so really when there's something that's legalized, it's something that and, and, and naturally attaches a lot more regulations to it. A decriminalization approach. Which really focuses on what happens criminally when people when people can 
get thrown in jail um, as a result of an exchange of services, right? And so yeah, it's more of a, we were focusing more on a civil approach um, than a criminal approach. And so it's, and that's really like in a nutshell, yeah, like focusing really on the civil approach, ensuring that people are uh, not harmed as a result of criminal penalties being attached for, you know, exchange of, of, of services, of monies, et cetera. Um, you know, and there, there are many ports. So Amnesty International, for example, has recently issued a pretty broad toolkit that focuses on the example or differences between you know sex work sex work sex trafficking but also differences between like what's legalization what's okay. decriminalization what's partial legalization what's partial decriminalization etc and so back to your question about what can be done and so i do think we have to focus on anything that's decriminalizing sex work and focusing on public health some data for your viewers the public health evidence is very clear uh decriminalizing sex work could avert hiv infections by up to 46 percent but decriminalization is more about preventing HIV, as we stated earlier. It's about removing barriers, um, increasing cultural competency, uh, really breaking away from cultural incompetency uh, between sex workers and the systems that really continuously discriminate against them, uh, the institutions that continuously discriminate against them, and the institutions that should really protect their human rights. Because we're talking about human rights and social justice. Absolutely. This is more than just, you know, us, you know, having the language, right? It's about how do we actually have the language and then make that in a way where people can really experience the positive impact based on our language. So we need to remove criminal laws um, that would allow sex workers to do their work under safer conditions. And so SEST and FOSTA won't do that. The Anti-Prostitution Loyalty Oath won't do that. NSPD 22, Bush's directive won't do that. Um, really having laws that tear away the criminal penalties um, that would allow sex workers to do their work, to live their lives, to take care of their families is something that we need. They need social safety nets uh, and demand justice when rights are violated. And so again, you know, demanding justice is hard when you're forced to go to the people who may have abused you. And so we need to really create an environment where sex workers feel safe enough to come to folks who are not the law enforcement who may have enacted violence onto them. And so again, it's just really important to note that it's a human rights, sex work, decriminalization is a human rights and social justice issue. Um, and all people, including sex workers, are entitled to the full enforcement of those rights so they can f live fulfilling, healthy, long lives. I always like to end my podcast with an action item. Yeah. So what can people do to help make a difference in this area? What actions can they take? Yeah, so they can contact me at Preston at advocatesforyouth.org or on Twitter at Preston uh, Mitchum. And where that's really important is we have a sex, works, sex workers advocates coalition that is DC based. You know, I can give other things otherwise, but it's DC based. We're always looking for new members, always looking for new support. You know, what I didn't get to discuss with there is a sex work decrim bill um, coming through DC City Council that we need a lot of push for. Um, there's also efforts going underway for the Street Harassment Prevention Act in our DC City Council. So that's an action item. Also, everyone who, who lives in the United States can call their members of Congress. It's important to call their members of Congress, talk about sex work, decrim, make them uncomfortable. Really, remember, they work for us, right? Like, they're doing the work because we need them to do the work. So those are the two action items that can summarize. Great. Thank you so much, Preston. I think this was a great conversation, and I hope our listeners learned a lot. Thank you, Jenny, so much. For more information, including show notes from this episode and previous episodes, please visit our website at reprosfightback.com. You can also find us on Facebook and Twitter at Repros Fight Back. If you like our show, please help others find it by sharing it with your friends and subscribing, rating, and reviewing us on iTunes. Thanks for listening. <laughs>